welcome uh, Wendy and Dorian from the Deep Adaptation Forum for this podcast episode and which I want to know more and uh, share with my colleagues and practitioners what is that you have been working on in this intersection of practice and research within the Deep Adaptation Forum. I will get in a moment in more of what you do, but um, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves in a moment, but maybe just as a framing to explain a little bit like why I was interested to have this conversation with you. And this is part of the mini series that I'm doing in relationship to my PhD research. And at the moment I have not, let's say used yet your content for my research, but I thought that it would be super interesting to have this conversation with you because you were also, let's say, exploring the relational field within Deep Adaptation Forum, which is also self-organized and there are loads of resonances with the type of organization. And um, yeah, and then within this relational, I know that you have also touched upon emotions and effect. And on the other hand, you, you are, as I said at the beginning, between research and practice. And you we were also doing participatory action research which is a similar approach than the one I took. And then I thought it would be really interesting to jump in this conversation with you and uh, learn more and get to share a little bit of what you do. And with this, I would uh, invite you to introduce yourselves. And if you can also let us know a little bit more about the Deep Adaptation Forum, just a little framing so that we know what type of organization it is. What do you do? Over to you. We'll go first. Maybe I'll talk a bit about deep adaptation and how I got to know Dorian, and Dorian can talk about our research, perhaps. Um, I joined the Deep Adaptation Forum about three years ago, and for me, the Deep Adaptation Forum is about a safe place to talk about the possibility of collapse or people's experience of collapse, because some people are actually experiencing it. And from many things, climate change, social problems, uh, economic and political problems, um, so when I first joined, there appeared to me very clearly to be a lack of um, diversity in the membership. So we have quite a big group. I think now Facebook itself is about 16,000 members. Mm -hmm. But we don't often see people from the global south who, as a South African, I know are actually facing collapse directly. And um, myself and a couple of colleagues early on, including Dorian, wanted to start a group within the Deep Adaptation Forum um, and we self-organized to create something called the Diversity and Decolonizing Circle, which sounds very formal and very structured, and it has become something quite solid. But it started off as a, a fairly amorphous idea. In a way, it was uh, practical research. We were all looking to learn more about all these topics. Perhaps the first thing we touched on was anti-racism training with a colleague, Nanzu Kozo, Sidibi. And... Um, a lot of things have arisen out of that. Um, one of the things which perhaps Dorian can talk more about is I recently did a master's degree and um, my particular topic was transformational learning around these topics. So I investigated permaculture training, but it seemed to me that people going through anti-racism training were also had experience in some serious transformation of self. So when I heard that Dorian was doing research, I asked him if I could join him. Perhaps, Diane, you want to talk a little more about. Thanks, Wendy. And thanks, Alicia, for inviting us. Um, so um, I'm just um, in the final stages of my uh, PhD degree at the moment, um, which is on the topic of um, how online networks might help to um, bring about radical forms of uh, collective change through social learning. Um, so as, as part of this research, that um, this research project that I started with the University of Cumbria uh, in the United, United Kingdom, um, I have been uh, inviting um, others in two online communities to join me in uh, exploring this topic and making sense of it um, together. And so um, within the Deep Adaptation Forum, Wendy has been uh, my co-researcher in this. And we have um, been having lots of conversations among ourselves and um, with others in the, in the network. Um, 
and uh, it's a it's a participatory action research. Uh, so we 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 try to be as open as possible to whatever we were encountering and whatever people were sharing with us insights and see how uh, to see how we could integrate this into the cycle of the research itself. So it's, it has been a very emergent uh, sense making, sense feeling process. Uh, so I like that you also mentioned that this the place of, uh, of affect and emotions in this because we, we've really tried to bring this holistic um, perspective, I think, to, to what we've been doing. Um, so, um, and yeah, for the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, as Wendy was saying, it's, uh, it's a place that encourages people to engage with um, the topic of societal collapse as a result of various ecological crises uh, that are ongoing, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, soil erosion, all of those things that are happening at the moment that render the current industrial civilization really unsustainable and perhaps, yeah, are dooming it to uh, uh, to uh, to fail in the years to come. Um, and so the response of uh, the Deep Adaptation Forum is to look at those really heavy and uh, frightening topics and consider well, how can we um, in, um, engage with those topics in a way that is loving and that is based on mutual aid and solidarity and not uh, a pretext to just try and find safety at all costs and just, you know, build a bunker and uh, and uh, find some guns, you know, and, and just wait for stuff to happen. <laughs> but to see it as a, actually a, an opportunity to really uh maybe so so the seeds of uh new forms of being in community and society at least that's how i would um i would introduce it and different people in the network have different um focal areas or focal points some people are more interested in spirituality some people more on the practical aspects some people on the um, uh say uh more emotional processing and uh inner work and uh, some others um, on the social justice topics. And uh, I would say that the diversity and decolonizing circle has been uh, perhaps the most um, active self-organized group within the network, uh, really calling attention to the social justice dimensions of the current ongoing global predicament. Um, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you both for the context. Yeah, so within this very broad uh, container, we're going to talk about the diversity and decolonizing circle, as you both were mentioning. And I find this case particularly interesting because in my research, I was having a look at what are the things that are done in, in greater than in the case of our collective, where let's say that effect is invited in or even like intentionally brought in to support our self-organizing. And I think the some of the things I, I read in your case of the uh, diversity and decolonizing circle, I think show very nicely how it uh, effect is invited and then the different types of impact and value it had. So we'll go through that step by step, but to get started, can you tell us more about the diversity and decolonizing circle? How does it work? What type of things do you do? How has it evolved through time? So I can start. I think that there were six of us to start with, Dorian. Um, and Deep Adaptation has a governance structure. Um, there is a core team that, um, I mean, currently we're in a state of flux, but there was a core team for a long time, which did the administration internal functioning of the forum. And this was a topic of much interest to that team. So three members of that team were in the original um, forming, very much self-organizing. We kind of met in a strategy meeting and they said this is a need and um, someone I think arranged a poll for a date and we started getting together. We've been meeting on a Monday morning for I think two and a half years, possibly going on towards three years now. Um, some people have left very sadly um, just from moving on, moving out of deep adaptation and taking on roles. Um, some, some problems happened. 
Um, we've done a lot of work on conflict. So our self-organizing has not been dead straightforward from the beginning. Um, personality conflicts and having to do work through that, uh, from which we learned a lot. Uh, that actually, that process of working out how to deal with conflict has actually been a huge informing part of the work that we do. Um, I think we originally had the idea that we were going to teach everybody in deep adaptation how to be anti-racist. It really much, very much arose out of the same time as the Black Lives Matter protests were going on, and that was very much at the forefront of people's minds. What happened for me personally is I was very active and am fairly active in the Facebook group, which is enormous. And there's no accounting for what people will say and, and how thoughtless people might be in how they comment on posts. So the posts are very carefully managed and um, we have a group of very strong moderators, but you can never tell what people are gonna comment and that has to be caught, you know, when it's inflammatory. And I'd done quite a lot of work on that in trying to weave in a way of conversing with people to say, have you looked at how this appears to others? You know, trying to bring the others not present in the conversation. So we went from a very strong focus on running anti-racism training, which to be honest, there wasn't a huge amount of appetite for. So a few people came who were really super enthusiastic, but the percentage of the members was tiny, really tiny. To having a focus, and I think for a long time, our focus was on creating safety, particularly for, for um, BIPOC people, so Black, Indigenous, and people of color, who are not very present in, in the group. I mean, we're on Facebook, we're on social media, there's all sorts of issues with that. But as time has gone on, I think we're we're feeding into to different aspects in terms of where we focus. Our focus kind of shifts. And perhaps, Dorian, you want to pick up things I've left out? Yeah, thanks. I think you, yeah, you were just getting into what I was um, thinking of adding, which is um, that um, I think our group has had this double focus that has been... Um, well, each of us in the group have placed our personal focus on one area or the other. But those two main dimensions, I would say, would be, uh, on the one hand, the diversity and decolonizing circle as an action group, really trying to uh, help decolonize the way the network functions, right? So including with anti-racism or white supremacy or, you know, uh, homophobia, uh, all those different aspects that are so deeply embedded in the modern culture that they can just be invisible, right? In the the kind of the air that we breathe, or the the yeah the family histories that that we carry, all those things. Um, and the second dimension being the the diversity and decolonizing circle, or D and D circle as we call it, uh, being more a mutual support group in which uh, each of us. Um, bring our stories and challenges or endeavors that we are uh, carrying out on our own in various in various areas. So, for example, uh, Wendy, you were just talking about the Facebook group. So um, this is typically something that that you have been doing, right, and and championing uh, as a as a kind of a way of um, promoting this kind of awareness and consciousness in the network, right? You've been really actively engaged in this group and helping to steer conversations there in, in ways that can be illuminating for people. That's been incredibly precious. Um, others in the group have been taking part in uh, organizing trainings uh, for their uh, in their uh, professional circles, for example. Um, so yeah, each of us has kind of different um, activities that are going on on in each of our private personal lives or professional lives. And in the the D&D circle, we also have this opportunity of uh, sharing that and uh, inspiring each other and then perhaps um, deciding to start new activities on the basis of, of this cross-pollination thing. Um, so yeah, those two dimensions I think have been, have been quite present for us. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, there's this more like training part and working on the organization and how to decolonize it. And then on the other hand, there is a sort of, I would understand, let's say sharing circle, but with this very specific framing. Uh, can you say a bit more how you do it? So 
I mean, we wouldn't do it with a person that knows how to deal with this, but still like, how can we imagine it? It's like, we do a circle and then we all bring our challenges and as a, in a circle form, start sharing and talking about it. And then we mean next time with whatever needs to be said, like how, if you could give us some more details on that. I think what can be, and Joan, I'm just speaking first, but I hope I'm not, uh, um, what can be useful to share that other people have benefited from hearing is that over time, our meeting structure has developed and we have, um, I, I want to use the word rituals, that we have sort of structural things in the, they're all Zoom calls. So I've met Dorian and I think Dorian's met Kat. Yeah, but most of us have not actually met in person. Um, so we always start our meetings, and this is a little bit of deep adaptation tradition as well. We always start our meetings with a check-in, a personal check-in, and that it, it can be quite intimate. So we know quite a lot about each other's lives and, and what's going on for our, you know, behind the screen. And then we um, do a grounding. We may do a grounding first and then check-in. And the grounding can be of a spiritual nature, of a yoga nature, of a breathing nature, of a remembrance of nature and putting our feet on the ground. And that has been very helpful, actually, of bringing in the other into our meetings. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that later. That has actually expanded now um, in quite an interesting way within the rest of Deep Adaptation. We then start the Deep Adaptation Diversity Circle meetings, start with a success um, topic, which is interesting. The success is maybe now we say a little bit case studies because sometimes we're working on something personally, but it hasn't reached something that you could say, okay, full marks. And we've also, on on, on advice from our consultant, Monte Cosa, stepped away from using the word success as a white supremacy with one, um, to thinking about it as process and work and learning that's going on. And sometimes it's not at all a happy answer that we bring. It's difficult work that we're doing. I mean, I often bring stuff that's going on with my family. Um, in conversations with, you know, uncles and people that just difficult conversations, but there's progress for me in being able to speak to some of that with the right language from the work that we do together. So that's a big step. We we are very careful to try and use sociocratic type structures in terms of different people facilitate the meetings. It was always one person and we looked at that. We had conflicts about that. So now it's who wants to facilitate. We have a function of a vibe watcher to listen out and watch out for body language and, and conversations that maybe something is not being said or that something was said that might have been uncomfortable and can we go back to that and bring it up? So we're very conscious of conflict resilience within our small circle. Um, and we've um, introduced a hotspot section in case the vibe watcher doesn't pick something up in the process of the actual meeting, the business part of the meeting. There's a point where we stop before the end of the meeting and we've actually allowed more time for that now. Our learning has been that we need to give time to that to say, was there a hotspot? Did something pass by you quickly and you couldn't address that? And these sound like um, very specific things for running a good meeting, but actually we found that we can address some quite burning, emotionally difficult topics in that group. And we have processes and ways to to speak to them and, and work through them and we always try to to leave time for checking out so that's just talking about the one meeting structure and Dorian I'm sure you, you can add to that but perhaps you want to talk a little bit about our learning circles as well yeah I was going to do that um so what Wendy has just described uh, is the format for our weekly uh so-called business meetings um it's it sounds funny actually to call them business meetings because it's a uh, they're actually much more focused on relationship building and on uh, making sure that we bring all of ourselves into the space than on just saying, okay, item one on the agenda, item two, item three, and then let's get things done. And no, we try to really uh, not fall into, into those kind of patterns. Um, but we also have a second uh, recurring meeting, which is uh, on a monthly basis, um, which is the learning circle in which we really much more focus on um, uh, not getting things done at all, but really what, how are we uh, changing? What are we, what have we been reading, learning about um, or experiencing in our lives and, uh, and really focusing on the um, various insights that can come from those conversations. Um, and then there's actually a, a third 
type of meeting, which is also on a monthly basis, which is our community call or the uh, the open meeting, which is advertised on the Deep Adaptation Forum events calendar, that anyone can join. And uh, so we've had uh, different kinds of um, uh, processes or conversations happening during those calls. Um, some focused, for example, on uh, uh, having uh, sharing rounds on topics of uh, deep colonization. For example, how has how have I been? Um, my, how has my idea of education, for example, or perfection, been uh, colonized? Right? How how has my culture or my 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 background given me? Um, certain boundaries or certain unhelpful ways of considering what is education, you know, what is being professional, or those different things. And each person shares in a in a in a round, uh, not responding to to each other, but just deeply listening. Um, yeah, now we're in the in the middle of um, a more strategic process that is uh, held by uh, a friend of ours who is not in the the core circle of the the D and D. Um, but who has been regularly attending those open meetings for months and months. And she is inviting us, uh, all of us with an interest in those topics to envision um, the future of this work within the network. Um, and so, yeah, that's also a, a great way to, um, to connect more with other groups in the network, other people who are also doing amazing work and, and see how, uh, we can weave more networks and uh, and other kinds of relationships um, in those spaces. Thank you both for that um, overview. I was writing down uh, what you were um, also mentioning, Wendy, that was the structure of the meeting, but it also had to do with your learnings. So um, I understand that, um, and just to sum them up, because there were quite a few, you had mentioned before a conflict, so you've been learning how to deal with uh, personal conflict on the one hand. Uh, then you have um, found, found a way to bring in the other, let's say, in your in your meetings. Um, one of the things um, I heard as well was this um, reframing of success and thinking more about learning and, and process and not really uh, framing it as, as success. Uh, then in using or having, let's say, or opening the invitation to other different facilitators for the process. You had a Vive watcher, which I found very cool. The hotspot session, and then that you need time. So that you don't, uh, I understand that maybe the meetings are a bit longer, that you don't have to rush uh, through and, and get things done. So I was wondering if, um, are there, and I'm sure there are like many more learnings. Anything that you say, ah, this this is such an interesting insight that we learn, whether on the format itself on how to make it evolve, but also about what happened in Deep Adaptation Forum by running these processes for about I think you said almost like three years that you've been doing this. So yeah, what's uh, what have you learned? What's changed? My learning is immeasurable. I am a different person to the one that came into this, I must say. And uh, I think uh, in our in our mutual work together, Dorian and I in the research for his PhD, we really expressed that to each other of how much this shifting through the, the regular meetings and the, and the relationship building, the safety of being in good relationship with other people trying to do this very difficult work, this unpacking and decolonizing of self. So I, I, I want to emphasize that we have had just an additional piece of learning. We have had quite deep, deep and difficult conversations. Decolonizing is very much used in the context of land reparation. Um, and we don't use it so much in that sense. It's not that we ignore that or, or don't want to get involved in that. We're working on a solidarity project at the moment that will have more relationship to that. But we became aware very early on about white supremacy as a culture and the unpacking of that. And for me, yeah, trainings that were made available and people who came to speak to us and actually one of the participants in the main circle, this, um, I'm South African and I, I was educated during the apartheid era. I carry a lot of white supremacy culture within me. And this safe space of being able to speak to things that came up for me and 
being heard by people, um, including we, we have a Black South African lady who's been a, a consultant for us, being able to be heard by her and have feedback from her on, on inner work that I'm trying to do has really helped me shift. So I think what we realized, and there's a lot of different points, but what we realized early on is we as a group, best intentions aside, are not going to change 16,000 or more other people's views on racism. I think that was our intention and our idea to start with. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. All we can do, and we've done this as much as we can, is share our own experience. And, and Doreen and I have done quite a lot of interviews and discussions and shared the circles learning in recordings um, to try and express how deep the work is, how personal the work is. We all have different parts of us that are colonized and ideas that are colonized. Um, one thing that I can mention is deep adaptation has a long tradition of deep listening, which was brought by Katie Carr. So it's a it's a talking circle um, arising from indigenous and, and a lot of sort of group therapy type. There's a lot of different origins and people that use it. Deep adaptation has a structure for that. And our meetings are pretty much run on, on that basis that we try to make sure each person has a chance to speak. And certainly the learning circle works very much on that principle. So I bring my story and it might be emotive, people cry, people unpack, you know, really horrendous stuff, trauma even. We all listen. And then it's up to that person if they want feedback or if they want advice or if they just want to know that they've been heard and we just do mirroring without changing what we're giving as feedback. And I think for me, that's been one of the main deep adaptation tools that has been hugely valuable to me, that unlike conversations I have, most of my in-person conversations, where it is a conversation, it builds and it goes in different places. Deep listening focuses on the thing that I bring. And I bring that into the circle and everyone hears me. But in a way, I can hear myself then as well from the feedback that I get. And that's been a source of huge learning for me. We use that for conflict. So I had some personal conflicts um, with another person in the group, not Doreen. And we use deep listening as a tool for that. Um, a third person sat in a Zoom meeting and, and listened to both sides. Uh, yeah, and it's it's a very interesting tool. It's a very valuable tool. So I would bring that as a as a very interesting thing. I think we unpacked quite a lot in our in our research how that listening to someone lets them unpack. Mm. Yes, I I want to. Um... To go back to what you were just sharing a moment ago, Wendy, on about the the idea we had at first of uh, training thousands of people, or <laughs> yeah, there's to me perhaps one of the the most the deepest uh, insights that has come from this work has been just how incredibly challenging it is because of different things but for example it's there's an important part of um modern western culture that i think encourages people to um to do things in, in order to feel good about themselves look good you know and feel like uh we're getting somewhere you know, so there's this sense like, okay, we need to to look good and feel good, you know, like it's all positive stuff. But when you start to really engage deeply with the deep shit that our culture carries, um, it's really hard to experience those feelings. And in fact, if you are experiencing them, then you're probably, yeah, there's something that's not quite right about the, the method. And that connects also with what we were saying about the successes um earlier on so it's not work that is easy to invite others into it's painful self deconstruction deconstruction of so many subconscious things that we've been growing up with and it's hard to see immediate effects around us it's more like almost a sense of becoming more aware of the the depth of uh, historic trauma and systemic violence, um, particularly for white people, obviously, or people with more privilege who are kind of shielded by their privilege. And I include myself uh, as a very privileged person within this group. 
from experiencing directly those forms of oppression, right? But so I, I can go about my life and not experience racism where I am, right? Or I, I can, this is just a, a very simple example. So when doing this kind of work, all of a sudden there's this sort of a sense of, whoa, this is really a lot <laughs> to be unpacking. So um, yeah, how to develop this kind of personal and group resilience, including especially uh, the unpacking of tensions and conflicts that almost inevitably will arise either within the group or between the group and other people because it's extremely triggering work. But how to be able to develop the stamina to work through this and to not freak out and to uh, to still keep going, keep going more deeply and in a spirit of um, of mutual support and not saying I'm better than you. See, like I'm, I can notice this, you know, you don't notice it, you know, so I'm kind of more aware than you are. You know, it's, it's extremely uh, challenging, I find it. Um, especially then when you know that every country or yeah, culture may also have uh, different a different history, for example, around colonization. So uh, the way to discuss those topics or um, invite people into conversations will have to be different if you're uh, communicating with a person who lives in the United States or in France or in Sweden or in Russia, you know, or in China. I mean, there's the the forms of uh, colonizations. Uh, colonization and the impacts of racism or other kinds of othering can be quite diverse and so there's also this need to be aware of the the um, uh, similar patterns that are present worldwide because of the the wide-ranging impacts of uh, modern colonial culture but also the very different ways in which those things can uh, materialize in different places so it's a uh, it's challenging work, but worth doing. Important to do, essential to do. I think. Yeah, yeah. We've been describing. I mean, I was going to ask like, what's, in a way, you have been talking about it. But if we could talk a little bit more explicitly about the emotions or the emotional aspect, which I understand here, it's central. Uh, you've been using the words triggering, um, also conflict that comes in with uh, with this work, the self-reflection, the deconstruction, like all of that, that uh, what, what does with you. Um, but I'm wondering, yeah, if you could just reflect a little bit uh, on the on the part of uh, emotions and, and share it with us. And then if, if it would be possible to think about what is, you know, this space versus all the spaces that you have in Deep Adaptation Forum from an emotional perspective, if there is any reflection uh, that you could share. Well, um, to me, the space that we've created in, in the D&D circle has become uh, like my affinity group in a way. It's felt like a, a group of uh, not just colleagues but accomplices you know people that i i feel are my crowd you know like my tribe and so um i think this has been just absolutely critical for me to um to find this the sense of safety uh to be able to let go of some of my defenses become more allow myself to be more vulnerable and to uh invite others to be vulnerable and to to share those uh very deep and dark or these difficult to express kinds of stories or experiences with, with each other uh so to have this kind of container has been really important and um i'm sure that um other groups in the, the forum have created similar containers um that are just focused around a, a different kind of rallying points it's not necessarily diversity and decolonizing per se but um yeah to me this uh this space that we that we created has really functioned in this way and uh has been essential i don't know about you wendy 
yeah, I, I absolutely share that feeling of having, um, and family is not even the right word because we can have quite difficult con uh, conflict with family that's quite hard to resolve because of the relationship. But we've chosen to be really intimate with each other. And we've chosen, I think the, the really big thing for me in the word that comes up very often is we, we didn't have agreements about this to start off with, but we've committed to do this work together. So I see other groups within deep adaptation now in terms of self-organizing are trying to ask people to commit to six months or commit to a year. And we didn't actually do that, um, but we kept coming back. So where something's really blown up, for example, interpersonal conflict between two of us in the group, and I left the group, but then we went through a process of, of conflict transformation, and I re-entered and, and trying to work through things, and I'm going to use the word grudges, you know, sort of having that uh, scratchiness, perhaps is a word that we use more, um, to work through that, to really work through that so that you come back into a clear space where you're both in a in a a pure relationship i'm using language here that i'm sort of making up where we just enter as ourselves and we have all these tools in place to say i feel like you're not bringing your pure self that i know from other conversations that we've had to this conversation i feel like something that you've said here is you know not nice for me or not good for me or not true to you as i know you or there's something going on you look upset or whatever we've tried to build tools for that because we've experienced that what's not said is what becomes problematic in this work and that we can really, really help each other from the sense of committing to be in relationship and then just discuss all the stuff around that that makes it difficult to be in relationship. So things that people say or appear to do or um, intentions that feel, you know, not in alignment, we need to be able to question those and hear, really hear what the other person is bringing and this is probably just good interpersonal relationships. But when you do it from, as Dorian was saying, when you do it from the pivot point of we're actually trying to express something within the larger group around being inclusive and diversifying who we speak to, who we include, who we hear, we have to start with each other. And it's quite funny. I think each of us actually comes from a different region of the planet and has a very different experience of, of colonization. And even just hearing each other on that has created some scratchiness so what happens for me now when i'm in other self-organized groups within deep adaptation i'm actually much more observant when i see that there's conflict and it's actually people's world views that are in conflict and i'm wondering how we can bring some of the tools that we are using in the diversity and decolonizing circle to those groups and we're actually talking about that now of setting up a structure for conflict resilience some kind of education, widespread education around the need to have these tools and facilities for really difficult conversations. Um, and aligning that as well with collapse. You know, when, when you don't have as much food as you would like and your neighbor has a lot, how you discuss that is actually critical because a gun is one option, but a conversation is another and their belief structures, their worldviews, so yeah, it seems to have a very widespread value in terms of learning to have these these kinds of conversations. And they're not easy. I, I've been more upset than I can ever remember being in any other situation, <laughs> both at hearing other people's trauma in our group, a small group, but also in, in terms of conflict, really going deep into myself about who I am, that somebody else is questioning, and it's been really valuable. Mm. Go, Dorian, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to uh, to follow up on what Wendy was saying. Uh, I think there's um, there's a, a form of discomfort that is generative, right? That is, um, again, it's not something that will feel generative right away, perhaps, right? <laughs> but it's, I think, it's the work of growing up as a human being. Really, it's of maturing. That is it cannot be just nice and comfortable and smooth right because if it's that then you're probably just staying at the same point and um and yeah i think at the heart of everything all the topics that we've explored in the dnd circle um is the notion that um our culture our modern culture is based on separation fundamentally it's separating um an individual from another individual you know i live my life and you you know i have 
the right to have my own little comfort and I don't care about whether you're living on the street or not but um, it's also separating people uh, around hierarchies of race hierarchies of gender separating human beings from the rest of the the living world right uh, at the at the heart of the global predicament that we're facing I think is this those fractures that are preventing um, us from feeling empathy when we see uh, a forest that's been cut down or when we see uh, migrants uh, with a different skin color as ours uh, you know being sent back to their country uh, where they can't grow food anymore you know there's this sense of it's not my problem and um, I think the the work of D and D, as I see it, has been to to really realize how we we are all entangled together. We're all, you know, we cannot be considered separately. And so this is why the work of relationship building that you were beautifully talking about, Wendy, is is so is so critical. It's just uh, the sense of um, uh, learning how to be in relationship, even when it's tough. You know, even when you're with someone who has completely different worldviews as you, uh, or you know. A different culture whatever um and so then when we become more skilled at that then we can probably take this um uh this competence to all other spheres of our lives and perhaps model ways of being with others that could be inspiring at least that's um one theory of change perhaps yeah thank you so much for finding those words i was struggling to um yeah to, to name it so i think uh you were saying this um generative discomfort that uh, you were both uh talking about and and describing so kind of like what i hear you saying let's say maybe i'm, I'm uh, interpreting and i'm sure like i'm missing unfortunately like many of the aspects that you were talking about it was uh, very very rich what i understand is that engaging in these difficult conversations that are highly emotional and might lead to conflict that then all of this creates this generative this discomfort that i get to mature as a human being and we're working in this relational field so me with the others being safe with the others understanding other ways of seeing the world maybe seeing myself more critically and so through that then getting to these maybe like these things that this knowledge that gets a bit deeper to the bones one layer deeper at a time and understanding that we are all connected and so having a look at the problems of the world from that perspective that we're also a part of it that whoever is facing um, a challenge uh, might be something that yeah it's related uh, to to us in a, in a way anything that you would like to add to that before I move on I think I missed as irrelevant. Well, I'm just going to throw a big word in there, but uh, word responsibility. Then yeah. it becomes when you notice how entangled you are with everything, mm -hmm. then it's like I c you can't just say, "Oh well, it's not my problem." No, you. It's like it becomes your problem, right? Mm. You, that's at least that's how I I feel about it. There's the sense of I'm not. I don't want to have anti-racism discussions to show how intelligent I, I am or, you know, whatever. Although perhaps this plays up in some subconscious way, but it's more like a sense of this is, I feel responsible for, for you know, having at least inviting more conversations around those, those topics that are so systematically ignored in mainstream media or, you know, framed in ways that, that are not really helpful to social change. So, yeah. yeah. So it's like we're adding, um, let's say, it's the journey from the emotional and relational to the mo mobilization, as I understand it, to uh, do something together about those challenges that that we're facing. And specifically, I think you we're um, kind of like teasing um, around it, like saying a little bit um, what I read in the case study that uh, you shared with me that at the end or currently you are looking for ways to support in very, let's say, material ways the decolonization uh, work. So it's uh, after this time, you're also 
coming to this mobilization and working to do something about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, Joan used the word responsibility and it's it's quite an interesting summarization of where we've come from. So in the beginning, perhaps we were talking more about checking people's language and, and giving language by giving education. But where we are just at this moment, this very moment, we had a meeting today, is very um, solidly, practically implementing um, through a friend of ours who will initiate and we will follow and support a solidarity project within deep adaptation and how that actually translates, what that actually looks like is kind of amorphous at the moment. We don't know where it will go, but it's how do we practically take the work that we've done and go out, go out with and, and be responsible world citizens at many, at many, many levels. So it's interesting. There's definitely been a progression in the way that we act uh, from doing the inner work to yeah, acting on the responsibility that we've all come to feel. And I think that the responsibility word is very valuable, Dorian, because it also speaks quite a lot to the self-organizing that something brings us back to be in this committed relationship that is sometimes super shitty and super difficult. But that responsibility to, to grow up and do the work ourselves, but also that responsibility to others who we have the privilege to ignore all of those things. Yeah, this is really uh, interesting. I think from a let's say collective, like collectives, like network community, collective where a group of people that want to do something together. There are all of these. I don't know. Is it the vision? Is it uh, you know like North Star? Like what is it that mobilizes? people to do something to act together and what i'm hearing it's kind of that in this case the journey in a way comes from this relational and and from the emotional intensity and and like kind of and i don't, I don't want to i don't know how to frame it i've been struggling the, the past like 20 minutes or so like how to talk about emotions without wanting to be have a utilitarian perspective on them, but understanding that it's also part of our cognition and how we think and, and how we act. And maybe this format is bringing them even more forward than we're used to. And through this journey now, you have come to this point in which I know maybe, of course, there are many elements that might play out as well. It's You have been co-shaping some sort of, yeah, maybe vision is uh, like a not definitely not the appropriate term, but something that is pulling you in a direction and creating destruction so i find super interesting from maybe let's say this perspective of how you know how we take responsibility for something why do we act together and having a look at uh yeah this evolution that you've had i don't know if you want to add any comment on on that i was just thinking that this is a very interesting insight for me um sorry wendy do you want to go i can go you can go do you want to go first well, maybe just a, a very quick thing, but it reminds me of um, uh, all the IPCC reports, for example, you know, that have been produced over the past 40 years, just showing what's happening or what the scientists are, are you know, um, predicting about the evolution of the climate and how destructive it is, and just how this has been just shared openly everywhere. But it stayed on the on the cognitive level, and so I think it's if you don't have the sense the sense of emotional resonance, then it's unlikely that you'll be reading an IPCC report and then you know doing a, a hunger strike you know or uh, some kind of uh, project for social change you know I think it's, it's if it just stays at this stage of intellectual understanding. Um, and it's the same with racism. It's the same with anything. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, this is important, and uh, this is, uh, you know, a very crucial topic. But are you going to really be mobilize your energy and your, you know, maybe have sleepless nights, maybe encounter all kinds of discomfort around this? I don't think so. So, yeah, that's just something I wanted to note. Yeah, I think I think what I was thinking of adds to that, Dorian. I was thinking that one of the things that brought me, so I was in deep adaptation forum maybe eight months before the group started forming, the circle started forming. And Jim Bendal, who founded the movement and wrote the original paper, wrote a blog, The Love in Deep Adaptation. 
And that really, really spoke to me. I, I think this is the core cool message that Jim gives about collapse, societal collapse, is we can go into a, a fascist, uh, authoritarian, guns, prepping route, or th that's opposite. Um, or we can go in the deep adaptation route. And on our website, we talk about embodying and enabling a loving response to our predicament. And that, I think, really speaks to all the members of the circle, to our motivation in terms of responsibility is if we talk about emotions, is learning what it looks like to love others that sometimes we don't understand, we don't agree with their worldview, but we do wish them the best and we do wish them a long life and we do wish them comfort in the situation of collapse. And perhaps not so true around our small circle of generally white people, we have one black consultant um, living privileged lives a little bit away from collapse situations, but trying to expand our circle of awareness with love not always easily to people we don't understand, we don't share a language with sometimes, um, not never mind just English, but also a language of, of understanding their situation, their life situation, but coming back to love. And I think the conflict resolution process and, and conflict resilience, building conflict resilience into our structure helps us to come away from the, the, the common culture across the Western, I'm gonna say Western world, the weird world, um, global north society of every man for themselves that if I'm in conflict with someone I just never speak to them again or I find a way of excluding them it's like that's not going to work with a loving response to other people's difficulties I have to come back to that relationship and find a way of unpacking the the conflict so that I can still be in in a supportive loving relationship to that person and doing that work myself and not expecting others to do it so I think for me the key emotion and I don't know if love is an emotion or a commitment. <laughs> I think it's a responsibility in a way. But yeah, it comes back to love. And we we have sessions just to share where we haven't got a big project going on in the, the diversity circle where we have a party. You know, we meet on Zoom, we have a party, we put on silly hats, people get a drink, we play a bit of music. So yeah, share the love among ourselves as well. Yeah, this is super interesting. I think we can draw many insights for self-organizing groups and how we can engage in this sort of, um, yeah, let's say more emotional processes and even maybe thinking about, let's say, the things or the people we're against in a way or that represent completely contrary values and how to get into that empathy and how to, let's say, build this group feeling at least this growth and then come to this action I find yeah very inspired uh, by that so thank you so much both for for sharing uh, we don't have much time left but I would like to open another box and I'm I'm yeah I'm coming back to like this cue that you were mentioning now I'm uh, yeah I feel bad that I we, we cannot go into the conflict uh, part of it because I find that super interesting and one thing a sentence I really like that I found in some paper in the research was a researcher saying you know to be in conflict is to be in emotion so it's like kind of like the reason why both things are rejected it's like we don't want emotional intensity we don't want conflicts because we don't know how to go uh, about them so it's like both uh, like you know or to minimize them as much as possible whereas we know and I think that in our groups even let's say we know from a theoretical perspective, oh, that conflict can be very generative, but really going into it and, and allowing it and staying with it. Oh, this is um, this is a big one. And maybe, yeah, definitely a, a question I want to ask you, I need to take uh, this chance is also regarding conflict. Uh, we have seen in a couple of situations where, yeah, we can say it's interpersonal conflict, but it's actually... It doesn't have to do with the two people sometimes. It it can be that they are different parts of the system. So it's just like a systemic phenomena that is like manifesting through two people. So for example, it can be a gender issue. And it's not the let's say that person's fault, I would say, but it's how you know that person represents a certain part of the system. I don't know if you have like any insights on that, but like we have been. Uh, I have been wondering and talking to some colleagues, like, how can we go about that, that it's not really about the people themselves, but what, uh, yeah, comes through them from the upbringing, society, whatever. If, I don't know if you have any insights or whatever that you might have learned. 
um well i was just going to um to say that um one thing that has emerged in conversations around conflict within our groups has been um this idea that rather than talking about conflict resolution conflict transformation can can be more interesting more generative and one of the reasons that i sense for this is that conflict transformation as an approach uh i think pays much more attention to those deeper uh submerged parts of the iceberg in a way you know that um it's not it may look like just two people having a, a problem but in fact they each of those people carries brings with them a whole field of um uh, of social um, context that can be uh, ridden with tensions around gender or race or class uh, or what have you, or just personal trauma. Well, it's never just personal trauma. It's often something that also comes from way back when. And so, uh, yeah, maybe this um, um, conflict transformation approach, which I, I don't know a lot about yet, but which I feel we've been investigating in some ways within the D&D circle, uh, is not premised on the need to find a resolution right away. You know, how do we make sure that we go back to normal and we can keep going, you know, with our business, but more about like this, uh, uh, how can we have those deep listening conversations that Wendy was talking about to really go deeper and deeper into, you know, what why did this discomfort emerge you know why did we start having those uh those issues and perhaps it comes from a series of small things that go way back way back in in history and uh, and then just slowly go back and disentangle that thread and perhaps we still have some discomfort but we we have more clarity about why this this discomfort may have arisen in the first place and so yeah it's sort of a we can then go through another cycle of of exploration and, and another cycle and another cycle and and it helps with the growing up also i think what do you think wendy absolutely absolutely out of what you were saying the picture that came to mind for me and i don't think she'll mind me sharing it but non the topic that gave us our um anti-racism training that we've run a couple of times in the deep adaptation forum tells a little bit of her own personal story as a black South African woman. She now lives in Europe. And I have to be honest, I actually can't remember the specific parts of her story that she told. I remember the emotion. I remember absolutely hearing her, someone that I'd formed relationship with and, and had love for, hearing her express the difficulties and the pain and the trauma inflicted on her by racist attitudes and, and racist responses from people like me. Um, and, and really feeling them. So this is, I think, where the emotional side of it really helps to transform and, and real learning, real change in terms of how I express and even how I think about certain things has shifted to a different track in the record. You know, I'm, I'm just playing from a different, even a completely different record, to be honest. It really arose out of emotional connection. I was really able to hear her instead of seeing her as a as a you know a TV show expressing something horrendous um, and and letting it flow over me. I actually really felt it in my body. And um, we are lucky enough to have um, an LGBTQ person representing in our circle, where again that has happened. You know, stuff has been has been done not necessarily by us to that person within the circle. But that person has been able to express difficulty and complexity and, and trauma and emotion around their being othered that we can really hear because we're in direct relationship with that person, deep personal friendships and love that I almost feel like it's happening to me. I mean, perhaps that's going one step too far, but I think that's the type of structure we're trying to create where we can really sit with that person in the fire and that kind of hearing that kind of emotional pain really doesn't allow you to sit in your old worldview. It really pushes you to experience that person's worldview as your own and it's not comfortable and then you want things to be different. You know, so I feel that there's this profound potential in having those deeper relationships as opposed to watching a really good YouTube video or attending a really good training 
where it's someone you don't know and you can hear it all, but none of it actually scratches into your, your deeper emotional layers. So I, I absolutely agree with you, Alicia. I, I don't know how you create that. We have, and we're trying to unpack how we have, but it comes from committed relationship, I think, is the first step. Yeah, I think now I understand better the, the emotional scratches you were talking about before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe on that note, would you have any advice, or I understand it's something you're you're working on, but if we say, ah, you know, we would be interested in a diversity, the colonizing circle, and or engaging in conflict transformation, like any little tips or things, uh, even if it is don't do it alone and get a professional to support you. But yeah, like anything that you could share with us on how anyone watching or listening to this podcast could do a first step towards that. I think, I think the thing that always comes up for me is advice that Monty gave us early on. This is generational work. So we've been lucky enough to find others who are really committed and doing this work. And we've been doing it intensely for nearly three years now. And it feels like a drop in the ocean. I mean, it feels like we've always got more work to do. So I wouldn't even feel comfortable at this stage offering to run any kind of anti-racism training or even decolonizing training. I haven't done it yet. I'm still in the process. So for me, we have to realize that this culture that we've been um, layered on you know, the, the, our education has layered this culture on in onion skins over us. It takes a long time to unpack it. And I really mean time. I mean, I don't think you can go on a course and do it. I think you have to find a way of, of committing and work with others. I think you need someone who puts up their hand and says, I'm seeing something here. Can we talk about it? And be in relationship where you can actually hear them and, and not just dismiss it. Absolutely. And I love that you you brought up the image of um, onion skins, Wendy, because uh, to me, this is also, a, it has been a, um, a very useful metaphor to think about this work. Um, it's a metaphor I heard from Vanessa Andriotti, which is a, a scholar in um, decolonial studies. Uh, uh, we've been sharing a lot of work of in, in the circle. Uh, Professor Vanessa Andriotti, and um, she says that the the usual Western education model can be compared to um, um, climbing up a mountain, right? So your objective is to get to the top of the mountain, right? You accumulate all the knowledge, you become the expert. You know, everyone goes to you, and you know, you sort of have this uh, this dominating view over the field, you know, and you can teach everyone, you know, what's right. Whereas, in fact, what may be much more uh, important as a form of learning nowadays is, in fact, onion peeling. <laughs> so it's you ha it's peeling one layer after another, you know, of the different ways in which um, my your worldview has been created, you know, in, and even not just worldview, but uh, on a neuro biological uh, level why are we still um, living the way we are that's not just because of wrong ideas but it's because we are addicted to certain ways of being that are comforting that are making us feel good that are making us feel like we have control or expertise or authority or you know that we know who to turn to as the leaders or you know the people who who will guide us where we need to go so there's there's just a lot to unpack um and so peeling away those onion skins um tends to bring up tears <laughs> so there's also this part of the metaphor which i find really uh really nice is so in response to your question alicia i think it's you have to bring together some people who are who enjoy what these who are ready to be peeling onions for some time and uh, so who have this kind of um, commitment and who are also benefiting from the presence of uh, people who have been peeling onions for a long time and so who uh, who can also guide you on how to do it in a way that you know makes it a bit less uh, overwhelming and uh, 
that can be also very grounding when conflict arises, when the energy can be a bit volatile. So I think the presence of Nantokozo, uh, who we've been talking about already, has been absolutely key to our group uh, to really give us this sense of uh, uh, accountability and this sense of um, um, there is someone here who is like an elder in this um in this generational work you know uh i i I'm, i don't think i've heard nontokozo use the word expert but more like a person who has been on this path much longer than we have and uh so yeah if you want to do those things in a self organized way especially starting from scratch i think it's really important to have a key person who is there at least some of the time to give guidance um because uh yeah it's it's just extremely complex yeah what a beautiful place to live it with uh with the learning and even uh this link to the role of elders and uh yeah this different way of learning which i hope we will not have time today but i hope we can have another conversation at some point i want definitely to ask you about the Wegner trial uh, a trainer social systems uh, learning model that you both have with been working a lot on and many other things that you have learned. So this serves us as a basis to understand what you have been studying and practicing. And yeah, it's really inspiring. So thank you so much for having shared all of this with us. It's been yeah an absolute pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. I have massively enjoyed this conversation with Wendy and Dorian. I hope to have them for a second part on many other aspects of their research, which is very, very vast. And they have had a look at social learning theories, which I'm sure is going to be super interesting for many of you. But from this first conversation, a lot of takeaways already, starting by this journey that uh, they were talking about from, so starting to share and understand each other, being in relationship, and then through that process of being in these highly emotional and very challenging conversations to getting to this mobilization or responsibility part, which often I think that in many experiences I've been with, we finalize our journey in a self-reflection or maybe some little action for our group. But in my understanding, what I have um, taken from them is that when it's actually really there and highly emotional and as raw as it needs to be, it can take us to this responsibility and then doing really something about those feelings that we have, these things we believe that need to change from our system. So that's uh, definitely a big takeaway. Second one would be these um, emotional scratches that uh, Wendy was talking about and um, that you might have encountered. I have also heard it in a few different places, like what are, you know, how we are in deeper relationship by also engaging in this discomfort. And um and yeah, here uh, Dorian was talking about the generative discomfort that it can be to make us grow, to help us mature. We also talked about conflict transformation and how it's good to stay there, keep coming back, keep working on it. Because uh, usually these conflicts that we were saying in our discussion have a systemic background and are highly, highly complex. And it's not us or not only us as individuals, but it's a much bigger conversation. So taking time to work through that. And then we finalize with uh, this beautiful analogy of the onion and um, shedding tears and, and peeling the onion as this way of learning that is required for many of these very challenging conversations, how we keep, how, we need also to engage in time to be peeling that onion and getting deeper and then getting into this personal and social transformation. So from a self-organizing point of view, our 
I wasn't really able to build the link during the conversation. Somehow I was feeling some sort of um, apprehension or even re rejection in, in maybe thinking about, ah, but this question I keep having, how are emotions, um, how can they support self-organizing or what is their role? Because I, as I also mentioned in the conversation, I really don't want to take, to get into a utilitarian approach to them. But I think, thinking about it, it's more about acknowledging, acknowledging that they are there and also working with them. And through this awareness, then also tapping into the potential of these emotional spaces that take us to this personal transformation. And of course, it's not only individual or it happens actually because we do this in the collective. So what does it change in our field in our group when we engage in this type of work. So again, one more um, example of how emotions can support self-organizing and these processes and staying in relationship with each other. Yeah, hoping to have a further conversation with them. I hope you enjoyed this a lot and could take some takeaways for yourself as well.